Good evening. Bienvenue à l'Université McGill. Welcome to McGill. My name is Rosie Goldstein. I'm the Vice Principal Research and International Relations here at McGill. And it's my great pleasure tonight to welcome all of you to this McGill edition of the 2014 Canada Council Killam Prize Lecture Series. Nous sommes fiers d'accueillir D.R. Fraser Taylor à McGill, lauréat du prix Killam en 2014. As a preface to tonight's dialogue, and it will be a dialogue, as you can see, we're set up for the kind of fireside chat. Um, I want to give a brief introduction to the Killam Prize itself. The first Canada Council Killam Prizes, recognizing lifetime contributions to scholarship, were awarded in 1981 from the Trust of Dorothy J. Killam. The trusts were established in 1965 in memory of Dorothy's husband, Isaac Walton Killam, who you may know as one of Canada's wealthiest financiers. He uh, left uh, this um, trust for the benefit of the Montreal Neurological Institute at McGill University, Dalhousie University, the University of Alberta, the University of Calgary, the University of British Columbia, and the Canada Council. I quote from Mrs. Killam's will. The purpose in establishing the Killam Trust is to help in the building of Canada's future by encouraging advanced study to develop and expand the work of Canadian universities and to promote sympathetic understanding between Canadians and the peoples of other countries. The Canada Council Killam Prizes are considered among the most prestigious awards in our country and have been awarded each year to eminent researchers and scholars in recognition of their contributions to academic advancement quite broadly in Canada. The first McGill-based winner of a Killam Prize was Professor Brenda Milner, who won the prize in Health Sciences in 1983. Since then, a total of 20 McGill researchers have received the prize in their respective fields. Le programme Killam de Conseil des Arts comprend aussi les bourses Killam, qui appuient les chercheurs engagés de, dans ces projets de recherche exceptionnels. En 2014, Professor Lionel Smith, directeur de Saint André, Paul André Crépeau de droit privé et comparé ici à McGill, a été nommé Boursier Killam. We're very proud of Professor Lionel Smith. The 2014 Killam laureates are leaders and pioneers in diverse fields of study, include from nanotechnology to the search for vaccines for HIV AIDS, from public policy development related to residential schools, treaty rights and native newcomer relations, to advancements in diagnostic instrumentation for manufacturing, optoelectronics, biosensors and biomedical imaging, and of course, cyber cartography. It's now uh, the right segue into introducing tonight's esteemed guest, Professor D.R. Fraser Taylor, who is the director of the Geomatics and Cartographic Research Center at Carleton University and the 2014 Killam Prize winner for the Social Sciences. An alumnus of the University of Edinburgh, Professor Taylor completed his postgraduate work at the University of London and Harvard. He introduced and continues to develop the new paradigm of cyber cartography an enhanced form of geospatial information management that is deepening our understanding of complex issues such as trade and economic patterns, international development, and the risk of homelessness. Put another way, cyber cartography has introduced the world to living maps created by and for the communities they represent. From rural Kenya to Canada's northern communities, Professor Taylor continues to explore his interest in international development by applying his expertise to these new, innovative cartographic forms. On the world stage, Professor Taylor is actively involved with the United Nations, the United Nations Initiative on Geospatial Information Management. Among his many honors, Professor Taylor was the 2012 recipient of the Canadian Award for Environmental Innovation from the Royal Canadian Geographical Society and 3M Canada. And in 2008, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, our country's highest honor for a scholar. Tonight's Killam event uh, will, as I mentioned, be a little bit different than our usual format. It's not really a lecture, so uh, it is more of a moderated discussion with our laureate. Um, our moderator this evening is Ms. Jackie Rourke, manager of audiovisual content at McGill. Jackie is well known at McGill. She was previously a reporter with CTV Montréal, and she's well known for engaging her engaging interviews with researchers. We're going to, we, we want this to be an interactive kind of format. Uh, it will be more casual than a lecture. Jackie will moderate it. And we also want your input, so start thinking about questions, because there will be a question and answer period for you to pose questions to Professor Taylor. So without any further ado, I want to welcome Professor Taylor and Ms. Rourke to come up to the uh, comfortable chairs and uh, begin the discussion. Thank you, Rosie. So 
get comfortable. Thank you very much, Professor Goldstein. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. It is my great pleasure to have this conversation with Professor Fraser Taylor, uh, whose work is very innovative and uh, extremely interesting, as you'll learn if you're not too familiar with the term cyber cartography. It's a, it's a new term that you coined, I understand, back in 1997. So I think let's start with a basic definition of what is cyber cartography, Professor Taylor. Well, if I had to sum it up in one sentence, uh, which is hard for an academic, as you know, <laughs> it would be the application of geographic information processing to an analysis of topics of interest to society and the presentation of the results in forms that people can easily understand. So that's a pocket definition of what cyber cartography is. It says a whole lot there, and a major element of it is the input of the community, or the input of many sources in a geospatial uh, context. Yeah, we are not a typical geographic information system, which is a well-known scientific technology. We are multimedia. We use all forms of media, text, graphs, maps, pictures, videos, you name it, rap videos. Um, we are multi-sensory. The theory is that you and I, when we look around, are using all of our senses in understanding the society we work with. So why can't we create maps which use all of the senses? So we can already do touch and sound and sight quite easily. We can do smell although we're experimenting now with uh, the need for a, a scent diffuser. Uh, we're even experimenting with taste, and uh, we're now moving on to looking at emotion as well as the senses. So these so-called atlases, and an atlas is really a metaphor. It's not like your typical sense of an atlas, which you have a book, you turn the pages. <coughs> this is a metaphor for all kinds of qualitative and quantitative information linked by location. So we do many, many things, and um, we are very interested indeed in ensuring that communities have their own voice in this process. <clears throat> you know, when you look at some topics, you always think there's one right answer and one wrong answer. This is right, that's wrong. The reality is that for many things, there are various perceptions of the same sets of facts. And those perceptions are important ones. So rather than providing simply one explanation, we provide a number of explanations. The explanation of the local community, the explanation of the scientists, the explanation of the bureaucrat, the explanation of the politician. All of these are different ways of looking at the same information. <clears throat> Cyber cartography allows all of these pieces of information to be presented. Then the user, when they look at things, get an idea of the complexity and the potential conflict which goes on over what we think are straightforward issues. Rarely is it an objective answer to anything when you're dealing with societal issues. Well, I thought it'd be good to give you an example of this kind of atlas so you have an idea of what we're talking about. So we, we put one together. Yeah, um, excuse me. There are some of the communities in uh, Nunavut, all 26 of them. Now, this project is called the Views from the North Atlas, is done with um, the Nunavut School in Ottawa. Uh, it was established in 1985 in order to bring people down from the north to prepare for Nunavut as a territory. The students take the old pictures from the archives. They take them back into their community in the north. They discuss with their grandparents, with the elders, what the photograph is about. Now, these photographs were taken in the 50s and the 60s at what I call a bad time for Canadian policy. This was a time of the residential schools. And the photographs were taken as a government propaganda in order to show how the government's uh, resettlement program in the north was operating. 
We're visually repatriating those photographs and using them as a means of collecting new stories and new information. And the people who are doing the collecting are Nunavut students themselves. So they go and talk to their grandparents, they talk to the elders. And then they, we also give them digital cameras, so they take current photographs from the same perspective and compare and contrast. So it's a visual repatriation of heritage. And we use videos, uh, sound, and a variety of different ways of um, expressing this. So it links in with the Library and Archives um, naming project. And we're using photographs which were taken for one purpose for a very different purpose. And we are finding out how Inuit feel about these things. And it's enormously exciting for the students to go back into their home communities and interact with their elders in new ways and collect new information because there's a generational gap in Nunavut caused by the residential schools and this helps bridge that gap. So in essence, the outside researcher here is a catalyst. The reality is being done by Inuit, them Inuit themselves who are taking control of their own research and their own stories and representing their own views in different ways than any outsider could possibly do. So this is just one example. Most of this work is being done in the digital humanities with our arts and cultural people. Uh, Carol Payne in the um, art and culture department at Carlton is, is the chief mover of this particular set of, um, of atlases. They came to us, we've made it into an atlas. It's now available online. And you can look at all of the um, various elements in the, um, in the atlas because online. Because as you've, as you've pointed out, for the Inuit, for example, mm. theirs is an oral tradition. Yep. So that when they lose an elder, they lose, they lose so much history. That's right. The, 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 the term I use for the elder is when an elder dies in Nunavut, it's like a library and an archive closing in Montreal. That much information is being lost. So not only are we interacting, we are also preserving some of the traditional information and the traditional stories that people have in those communities. So there's a strong preservation and archival function which we're serving at the same time as bringing forward people's stories. We're essentially about storytelling, allowing people to tell their own stories. We call them geonarratives only because we're using location as the principal way of locating where that information is coming from and who's giving it. It's very empowering to the community mm -hmm. as well. Can you give us perhaps an anecdote uh, from the time that uh, you and your colleagues have spent there gathering all the information and the stories of the impact it had on the communities? Yeah. We did an atlas for the small community of Arctic Bay, which is only a few hundred people. And we did this together with the um, Nunavut Arctic College, with uh, the local um, youth coordinators and with the elders. Our idea was to create an atlas of Arctic Bay where the content of the atlas was decided by the people, not by the outsiders. And we got all kinds of surprises of the kinds of things that the, the community would like to see in the atlas. For example, the youth produced a rap video called We Are Not Eskimos. And in it was all kinds of social messages about how they felt about how outsiders were viewing them and how wrong we were in our views. We had a family, there is a family in Arctic Bay called the Willie family, there are two brothers. They decided that Arctic Bay needed a golf course. Of course, there's no grass. However, Willie's produced a nine-hole golf course by sticking tin cans in the tundra, and they wanted the golf course in the Arctic Bay Atlas. So if you look at the Arctic Bay Atlas, you will find Willie's golf course. The main event, in a social sense, was a dog sled race. So there's extensive coverage of the dog sled race. There were no street names in Arctic Bay. A gentleman called Frank decided it's time Arctic Bay had street names. So he called the street on which his house sat Frank Street. Within an hour or so, everybody in the community was saying, to get there, you go down Frank Street. 
We had two little kids standing outside the door of the workshop saying, well, what's going on? Uh, three of them, actually. One was eight, 10, and 12. They said, we want to put our fishing lake on this atlas. So they came in. We showed them how to use the system. And within half an hour, they had put in Dead Dog Lake. What's happening is that when you give people control to demand and create what they see of themselves, you get a very different message than you get from someone from the outside coming and giving their perceptions. Now, I'm not suggesting that one is right and the other is wrong. I'm suggesting that there needs to be a rebalancing between a supply-driven approach, which has been the case in the past, and a demand and a creative approach from the community, which we argue is the present and the future. Because if the community takes ownership of these things, they remain alive, they are living atlases, because the community is constantly updating them <coughs> and constantly <coughs> referring to things that are of importance to them in the process. So that's one example from Arctic Bay of uh, some of the surprises you get. Uh, of course, you've got to change your technology in order to take cognizance of new things that you didn't expect. So we have moved from um, uh, what a, a computer scientist would call a, a schema type approach where you determine in advance what you want to a schemaless document oriented approach where we can absorb anything that the community comes up with and put into the, uh, into the atlas. It's a relatively new platform, but already yep. it's been used in, in many different contexts yes. beyond the north. Can you tell us about one that's particularly interesting if you're trying to grapple with socioeconomic issues? Uh, one of particular interest, the risk of homelessness in Canadian cities. So yeah. taking data and finding a way to make it visually have, have a stronger impact. Well, the Risk of Homelessness Atlas is, uh, was done together with the Canadian Federation of Municipalities, the City of Montreal, the City of Toronto, and the City of Calgary. The objective was to take the 21 variables which indicate that you're at risk of becoming homeless, to map these and present these in innovative ways, and then present the results visually so that people got a better sense of what this meant. For example, when we showed the, um, the construction of social housing in Toronto over time, from the initial time many years ago when the first one was built to the present, <coughs> what happens is the map starts very slowly. Then there's a burst of um, creation of social housing and then silence. For the last five years, there's been virtually no social housing produced in Toronto, only condominiums and other forms of, uh, of housing. So by visualizing the effect of um, each of those variables, you get a better understanding of the risk of homelessness in Canada. By doing it Canada-wide, you can also uh, get perspectives of how one uh, town is doing vis-a-vis -vis another town, so it helps in a comparative sense to give a sense of what's happening. Now, the 21 variables were not chosen by us. They were chosen by the experts working on homelessness in the Federation and in each of the societies. But when we visualized the information, we were revealing new information that even the experts had not thought of before. So visualizing itself is a powerful analytical tool as well as a means of expressing the results of your analysis more effectively. But of course it raises a lot of concerns perhaps. For example, with that, perhaps municipal officials don't really want it to be so blatantly obvious that no social housing has been developed in recent years. Uh, some of them certainly do not. Uh, this is not uh, confined to municipal officials, believe me. <laughs> uh, there are many parts of the Canadian economy and society where people would rather not know or not have known what is going on. Um, yes, there are risks in showing this stuff visually, but we believe that um, revealing facts is never a bad idea. Who owns the data once it's inputted, for example, back to the Arctic, or, mm. or if a community, someone inputs 
how, how does that get managed so that the data or the, the video that's uploaded doesn't get manipulated somehow? Yeah. How, how do you regulate that? The community owns <coughs> the information. We own the copyright on the atlas, but the information in that atlas is owned by the community. And we have been working with a group of lawyers at the University of Ottawa for some time in terms of looking at the ethics and the legalities of ownership and use of information. And it's not an easy topic to deal with. For example, in our sea ice atlas, <coughs> many of the hunters do not want information such as the location of polar bear dens known to anyone. So that is restricted only to the hunters, not to the society as a whole. So in each atlas, we have a layered set of functions as to what is available <coughs> for everyone and what is available only to a few. But the ownership remains always with the community. You mentioned in your opening statement using all the senses. Yep. So we're very familiar <coughs> with, with sight and sound. Uh, smell, taste, how does that figure into the atlas? Um, <coughs> Smell, smell, excuse me, just a moment. There is a thing, a device called an electronic nose. An electronic nose can sense a smell, break it down into its component chemical parts. These can be transmitted uh, through the internet to your computer. They can be reassembled in the computer and using a scent diffuser, you can puff the smell out into people's face. Uh, that we can do. The big problem there is, again, a societal one. The companies that make the scent diffusers went broke because the market was not big enough. So we cannot use smell as we would like because we cannot get a diffuser anymore. There is a similar device called an electronic tongue. But uh, the sense of taste is much more complicated. And it will be quite some time yet before I reach my goal, which is to have this electronic tongue taste a 50-year-old malt whiskey in Scotland, recombine it in the computer, send it to me where I can have a glass in the evening. <laughs> but we'll get there. That's a whole new take on <coughs> where 3D printers start yeah, yeah. us going. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, you also have a, a great interest in development. Yeah. Um, and your technology has clearly had a very holistic, you, you, from the outset, it, it, it strikes me that it's been very holistic, uh, trying to democratize the information and the, the access to the technology that can empower a community. Maybe you could discuss a little bit about your background in development and, yeah. and how you came to, to ensure that this was the, <coughs> the sort of path of, of the, uh, the development of cyber cartography. Yeah. Um, I'm a rural development specialist. Um, uh, I spent many years in Africa. My PhD is on rural development in one of the African uh, districts. Uh, it was a district where um, there were 400,000 uh, people and very few non-Africans. Um, what I learned is that the inherent wisdom of local people is very important. And it's important to listen to them and not dismiss their views because they are at the cutting edge of um, the development issue. I'm reminded of the old joke of the, um, the hen and the chicken walking down the road, <coughs> and they come to a sign for bacon and eggs at McDonald's. And the chicken puffs out her chest and says, I'm involved in that. The pig says, Madam, you may be involved, but I'm committed. <laughs> now, when it comes to development, or for that matter, um, uh, environmental change in the north, it's the people at the front end who are most affected. And if you do not listen to them, then you lose a great deal. Now, people ask me, how can you come from a rural development specialist in an African context to cyber cartography? The answer was that from an early stage, I was using location as a means of understanding things. Before the computer maps were invented, we used plastic overlays. But once you put three plastic overlays on top of each other, the relationship disappears. 
So early on, I um, began to work with uh, Harvard uh, University, which gave me the power to transfer 20, 30 variables on top of each other and indicate where those variables coincided. Now, locational representation is not causality, but it's a very important way of determining what's happened. But back to the local community for a moment. <coughs> um, the Franklin Expedition, uh, recently uh, brought forth by the government as a triumph of science. If they listened to the Inuit, they would have found those ships many, many years ago. They did not listen, in my view. Or if they did listen, they ignored it. Very often people ignore the views of people whom they believe are not educated. I'll give you an example, which is a medical one. In Africa, in Kenya, one of the early explorers was uh, moving through Naivasha on his way to uh, uh, find or try to find the source of the Nile. He arrived in this village and he found a beautiful flat plain with lovely trees down by the water. And the village was up here on a rocky slope. And he said to the local people, why don't you put your village down there where it's nice and flat, lots of water, lots of trees? He said, no, 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 no. Those trees are bewitched. If you stay by those trees, you will become sick. So being a, a, a Victorian man interested in science and a Christian to boot, he didn't like these heathens, so he went and pitched his tent uh, by, the, by the, the water and under the trees. Three weeks later, they all got malaria. The local people did not know the cause of this, but they'd watched the relationship between the two. So if somebody had listened, but not necessarily to causation, but to the relationship, then they would be a little further forward. So my philosophy has always been development from within, development from the bottom up. And if you think about cyber cartography, the same philosophy exists. It's development from the bottom up. So there's a correlation between the philosophy I have on development and the technology I use to understand societal problems today. If you could project in the next 15, 20 years beyond, what would be your vision for this technology? How would you like to see it developed and used? What the potential that you see for it? The potential I would like is, I think, to see the power of location used as positively as possible to resolve as many of our uh, societal issues as we possibly can. I would like to see people having a greater control over maps and mapping. Now, maps are one thing, but the process of mapping is another. And very often, when you think of a map or mapping, you only think of um, wayfinding or capes and bays and hills and valleys. The reality is that maps and mapping are very complex things. The map is a social construct. It tells you something about the society that made it. The map is a way of people expressing their own ontology, their way of knowing, their way of interacting with society, as well as the, the more traditional use of the map as a wayfinding device. So I think I would like to see the power of location used more positively and more seriously. For example, in international development, um, last week I gave a seminar to the International Development Research Center Development at the national level is dominated by economics, and it's dominated by macroeconomists. And macroeconomists are by definition aspatial. They don't think in locational terms. Yet I would argue, if you take a country like Canada, how can you explain anything that's going on in Canada in development terms without taking into account the regional differences between and among our various communities here? So I think I'd like to see a greater use of location and a greater degree of people who are prepared to listen to other people before they talk. Wow. Before we open it up to questions from the audience, I just have one more for you. So please think of your questions, and Lorraine will be around with the microphone to take it from you so you just stand in your, your, your place. Uh, we mentioned before, and, and your last answer leads me to thinking about adding the emotional mm -hmm. dimension to these maps and, and a bit of a, that sets off in my mind a bit of a minefield. 
how, how do you envision that being um, inputted and then used? All right. <coughs> this is already being done by a number of my colleagues, including uh, those at the Technical University in Vienna, who are trying to map emotions. The way they do it is, let's say you have an interactive map of the city of Vienna that anyone can access on their cell phone. The people who have their cell phones are walking down a street. If it's a woman, she comes to a street which is very dark with a lot of people looking not too friendly at the end. She types in, I'm at X, I'm afraid because of X, I have fear. That emotion gets onto the map. Anybody else looking at the map of Vienna at that time knows there may be problems in that particular street. Or you are particularly happy you've seen a particular event that you think is important and you want to express that to other people. So interactively, you are crowdsourcing people's emotions as they move through a city or move through anywhere if you want to think about it. Expressing pleasure at wandering around the coast of Newfoundland. Uh, all kinds of ways of capturing emotions in addition to the various senses. Um, it can be used. Crowdsourcing is a, is, a, is a very interesting and new development. Not that new, but um, fairly new. For example, in Rio de Janeiro, they have a major problem with traffic. They have 750, 650 monitors, traffic monitors in a central location to look for traffic accidents. They've recently done a deal with um, a large group of um, crowdsource enthusiasts using the Waze system, W-A-Z-E. They use their cell phones to record an accident, record traffic flows. They phone that in. It gets mixed in with the video camera's images, and you get a new impression of the reality of um, traffic in Rio. There are four to six million ways participants at the moment in the Rio traffic system. So there are all kinds of ways in which we can form new partnerships. The video I, I can envision, but when you're talking about the woman walking down yeah. the street, what's the visual representation? Are you, are you reading it's on what a map. she's... It's on a map. But have you, are you reading what she's typed in? Uh, she is uh, expressing fear, and you can express that in a number of different ways on the map. Now, we're still exper the, uh, my colleagues are still experimenting with the most effective representations of this, but the information is there, the data is there, and they're beginning now to say, how can we best portray this data. For example, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, if there is danger and you get a flashing red light on street X or street Y, uh, when you as another individual looking at the street map of um, the interactive electronic map of Vienna, that will tell you there's something wrong there. Interesting. So a lot of questions are popping up in my <coughs> mind. I'd like to open it up to your questions. Now, um, if you would like to raise your hand, and uh, we can come by with the microphone. Start with this gentleman in front. I have uh, hundreds of questions. This is really, really interesting. Uh, the whole idea is to raise questions. <laughs> um, I guess one is, this was just a question of your perspective. What do you think of Google Maps? Hmm. What do I think of Google Maps? Yeah. How does it play into everything you're describing here? Do you want the polite answer, or the politically correct answer, or the real answer? Definitely the real answer. <laughs> um, Google Maps sends, uh, serves a very important function, particularly in wayfinding and location. It revolutionized uh, the use of maps. For example, more people heard of Google Earth in three weeks than heard of geographic information system in three decades. So that is very positive. But remember, Google is there to make money. They are there to sell a function. Um, when you give information to Google, what you don't realize is that you've given Google that information. It is theirs. So for example, if a community takes Google and says, yes, we will give you the information, they no longer own that information. That information can be used for commercial purposes and is used for commercial purposes. You lose control of the information that you're giving. Now, location-based services, of which Google is one, is a very rapidly growing area 
<coughs> of the economy. Um, some figures I looked at recently suggested that in the United States in 2012, the location service industry created $1.3 trillion worth of uh, income, and one in four American workers use location-based services on a regular basis, and that's increasing at the pace of 30% per year. It's a growth industry. So Google has many advantages, but many disadvantages. If you want to sell your soul to Google, go right ahead. If you want to control your own information because that's important to you, don't sell your soul to Google. Now, I, um, I can finish off by saying some of my best friends uh, work for Google, which is, uh, which is true. And they're serving a very useful function. But it has disadvantages to it. And for small communities, I would be very careful before I gave information to Google unless you knew what was going to happen to it because the, per the pos possibility of misuse of that information is very high. Now, misuse of information is something which is a real concern for small communities in the north. Arctic Bay allowed a photographer from the National Geographic Society to come and film their narwhal hunt. They did so with uh, the best of intentions. He decided, after he'd taken all these photographs, that he would use this as an example of um, the wrong way to hunt and fish. He attacked the community through his video and his film. The result was that the community of Arctic Bay banned all researchers for two years because they were fed up of outsiders interpreting their way of life and misinterpreting it in their view uh, and giving a message which was the opposite of what they were trying to do. So you've got to be, in my view, very careful for too long, Inu Inuit have been objects of research. I'm hoping that through our process, they can become subjects and take control of their own research. So for example, our atlases are now being used in Nunavut Arctic College for courses for community, member, community educators in how to conduct research for themselves. And our aim is, in the longer term, not only to empower people to do their own research on their own lifestyles. <clears throat> but instead of, when, a, when a, a researcher comes into the North these days, as many of you know, they come in with a consent form. And the locals have to sign the consent form that they agree to, to give the, the, the researchers can use the, 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 the um, information. We're trying to develop a license process by which the community, when a researcher appears, gives the researcher a license and says, sign here. This is what you can and cannot do with our information. We want to turn the thing on its head. Now again, it's trying to strike a balance. And sometimes in order to strike a balance, you have to go a long way to that side. For example, in my various books on development above or below, uh, I'm looking at new ways in which you can combine the top and the bottom in new, more effective ways, because it's not one as opposed to the other, it's what the best balance is between and among the various facets involved. That's a long answer to a short question. That's beautiful, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, while we wait for the next question, perhaps we should mention that uh, the platform is open source. Yes. So that uh, anyone can make use of it. However, what are what are the caveats or what are the, the uh, procedures for that? Our view is that since our um, platform, which is called Nunadit, which means community in Inuktitut, was developed using um, public funds through research grants, we believe that all research should go back to the community without additional cost. So we firmly believe in open source and open specification approaches. Anyone can use it. Um, we're constantly trying to make it easier to use all the time. And we reckon that um, an eight-year-old can learn it in half an hour, uh, an adult probably a little longer. <laughs> uh, hi, thank you very much for the talk. I had a quick question. You mentioned that when you overlay the information together, uh, sometimes you get new insight that even the experts are surprised. Could you give us maybe an example of one of those? 
Which right. the, the, acoustics are, the, the acoustics yeah. are not very good in here. Oh, sorry. Hear. Yeah. yeah uh, hi. Uh, my question was, you mentioned that in the study, in the particular study with uh, homelessness, you combined various data sets. Yes. And by displaying them visually, you gain insight that even the experts were surprised. Mm. If you could give an example from that study or some other study where visually showing uh, something gained, brought yeah. you new insight. Thank you. Um, I'm not an expert on homelessness. The people who told me that they got new insights into the homelessness issue were the people dealing with homelessness as professionals, both in the city of Toronto, the city of Calgary, and the city of Montreal, as well as across the country. They felt that they got insights that they hadn't, since they had never visualized this information before, they had <coughs> set ideas on what was important and what was not important. One of the things that I think came out was the importance of the interrelationship between all 21 variables. Up until then, they had one explanation for this, another explanation for that. It's much more complex. And that relationship between and among variables was very important to them in policy terms. So they could then understand a new mix of potential policies which would lead to reducing the risk of homelessness by looking at what variables were critically important. In addition, variables which were important in one city or one town were not always the same in another town. So the macro planning approach of uh, this is the way to go had to be modified in, the result, in, the, uh, in response to the local realities uh, peculiarities which came out of the, of the system of visualizing the information. So that, I think, uh, helps address your question. We have a question on this side. Hello, thank you. That was a great talk. My question is about the uh, political nature of the technology itself. Mm. So, for example, using a Western technology uh, and having indigenous <coughs> knowledge and ways of life represented through that. Can you maybe discuss that a bit and how, for example, your comment about Frank Street, prior they didn't name streets, but now that you give them this map, the normative convention is to name streets on a map, so we're gonna name these streets. So what kind of implication does that have higher up the cultural <coughs> food chain, if you will? The reality is the technology is already there. The people in the north are already using cell phones. The kids are already texting. Uh, we can't pretend that that's not a reality. What is different in the way we do things is who controls the technology, the use of that technology. If it's the Google else of this world, then they are controlling the mapping. The only thing that has changed is the way in which the map is represented. We are trying to say Let's try to give back to the community a greater degree of control of the technology. The technology is not the problem. It's the use of that technology and who controls it, which is the problem. Now, in any society, who takes the decisions? For example, when a community comes to us, as many of them are doing, and saying, we have raised X amount of dollars we would like to use your technology to do X. This is a sure indication, or one indication, that if people spend their scarce resources to do something that they want done, then they have taken a decision that that's what they want to do. Now, interaction with communities is not an easy thing. For example, uh, the only reason we can work effectively with um, Nunavut communities is that some of my colleagues have spent 10 to 15 years in those communities building up trust. There's a trust element involved in the process. And that trust is key to understanding a community. Those of you who have worked in China or Japan will know that um, it takes about five years before a Chinese or a Japanese will, talk, will call you by your first name. But having called you by your first name, that relationship is then cemented and will go on for quite a while. Uh, these are no, there are no easy answers to that question, and you're right to ask the question. But think about it. Technological change is taking place, whether the communities like it or not. 
Do they have a role to play in how that technology is used? Can you give to the people who are arguing with the government? When a government GIS scientist comes along and says, we have incontrovertible evidence that X, Y, and Z is the case. If you can then say, the community then says, we have the same technology and our conclusion is different from yours. Have you given them a greater degree of power to deal with the pressures from the outside? Yes, there are political implications. The political implications is you're empowering to a degree a society by providing them with the same kinds of technology that is available to those who take the decisions from the south. For example, sea ice. For an Inuit, sea ice is an extension of the land. It's part of their way of life and culture. To people in the south, sea ice is a barrier to navigation and a barrier to resource exploitation. Google. Google Earth used to have sea ice coverage on their maps. They decided that they would take the sea ice coverage off and put in bathymetry instead. Why? The market for selling bathymetry to the um, commercial business is much greater than selling sea ice coverage to the Inuit. Uh, it's an example of uh, force majeure. Uh, I wrote to them and said, look, why have you taken away our sea ice coverage? They said, oh, we didn't realize we were doing that, which was not quite true. <clears throat> but um, these are not easy issues to deal with, and I don't pretend to have all of the answers. All I can do is say, this is the approach we're trying to do, and trying to make things at least a little better than they are at present in the process. Uh, the idea that the, those communities are isolated from, uh, and that this is somehow or other going to affect the community itself, that reality is upon us. We have to deal with it. As a point of privilege, I'm going to ask a follow-up to your question. It raises the question of the credibility mm. of the, the source material that's inputted if you're weighing, say, with the, the scientists and the, peop the usual sources versus yeah. the community. That will raise that debate. Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, for example, um, we have uh, an atlas which has many routes on it from place A to place B in the north. Um, from a southern scientific perspective, the metadata related to those routes are, is point A accurately located in X, Y coordinates? Is point B accurately create, uh, connected? Is the Z dimension included? Uh, is the route uh, sound in that sense? To the Inuit, the authenticity of that route depends upon which elder gave the information, not the X, Y coordinates. So I have walking, living metadata in the form of the elders involved, because everybody knows Elder X. Now, if it's somebody else whose uh, schemobile has fallen through the ice three times in the last year, you're not going to trust that guy's information. And the community know who is reliable and authentic and who isn't. So that's an example of um, authenticity and ways of looking at things, which um, <coughs> is Quite important in my view. Another question. <coughs> uh, yes, um, uh, Fraser Teller, um, former postdoctoral student of uh, Fraser uh, and professor at Concordia University. Um, and I have a question for you. Uh, I mean, one of one of the beauty of those technology is uh, GPS uh, that we can have in cell phone, etc. Is that we are kind of always geolocated. We always know exactly where we are, and we have X and Y coordinates to tell us where we are. Um, so it's great when we want to geolocate things, uh, but it creates some constraint. I mean that we always have to fit our information to this Euclidean system, meaning if I want to map emotions, I have to map it in relationship to buildings, streets, etc., etc. Uh, emotions is quite complex to map. We can measure some element of emotion, but it can be extremely complex to map. Would it be possible to design like a, a reference map that would not be based on a clean space, but on different types of spaces, such as emotional spaces, on which landmarks could be added. It's a street, but then uh, the entire world would have a different shape because different people would have different perspective on different <coughs> places and different locations. Is it going to be possible in the future for you? Is it going to be something that you'll be exploring? The answer, Sebastian, is yes. 
Uh, we're at very early stages in this emotional stuff, and there are all kinds of possibilities, and you've outlined some of them. This is not an area where my own research is very active at the moment. Uh, I'm more dependent on my colleagues uh, in other areas. But the whole concept of emotional space is, uh, is very interesting and very important. And we can find new ways of expressing that emotional space uh, in, uh, in a variety of different forms and in a variety of different situations. I believe it has potential. Remember that we're moving to a situation where every one of us is a data gatherer, whether we like it or not. <coughs> Your cell phone, if it's switched on, tells everyone where you are. And um, already there are companies out there mining that information uh, for commercial purposes. And the more people become sensors in their own right, the more challenges we will have in how that information is used, knowingly or unknowingly, <coughs> to the individuals who collect it. Thank you. Well, fascinating talk. Um, you know, you're well aware that many years ago, not too long ago, Western maps used to have areas um, that, that were erroneously called uh, terra incognita. I'm wondering if we, but of course they weren't unknown. They were known to people who had been living there for thousands of years. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm just curious, whether you whether there are any cultures for whom the idea of a map is itself a kind of uh, imposition, a Western imposition, a kind of inaccuracy, perhaps something destructive of, of uh, a cultural mythology, for example. Mm. Yes, <clears throat> if you think of a, uh, let me use a Canadian example. If you look at uh, Natural Resources Canada map of the Canadian North, there's very little on that map in terms of place names, and most of the place names on it are named after um, explorers or um, westerns. The atlas we're creating with the Kitikimelt Heritage Society, Place Name Society, the map is covered in information on the features and the names and the uses of different places in that territory. So you have two contra contrasting uh, visions. <clears throat> the unknown territory approach with very little on the map, and the territory as viewed by the people with a great deal of information on the map. And <clears throat> how do you come to terms with that? <clears throat> In naming terms, the, uh, the situation is that all of the power has lain in the hands of those people who produce the maps. We're trying to reverse that process and give power to the people to create their own maps and their own impressions. And to them, it's the South that's the unknown territory, not the North. And they look on the parts of the South with the same sort of amazement uh, as, no, do you mean they do those kinds of things? Um, as we would look at, the, look at the North. There's a need for a greater degree of uh, communication, and we believe that our, our atlases help in that process, communicating, educating, uh, making known the unknown. Who's next? I think you've mentioned quite a bit talking around in that piece you talked about is communication. You've talked about sharing, educating, um, and I guess the important piece about that is not just that you're putting information into this, but that someone is accessing it. How, how well are you finding that this information is getting accessed by outside sources, by people who might be interpreting this? For example, with the case of the Inuit, are policymakers, are diplomats, are people from this southern context accessing it and actually learning from this information, or is it being put there and still valuable but not being used? There is uh, <coughs> this debate in both the scientific and the policy community about the value of traditional information. Uh, there is one group of uh, people who have published recently who suggests that traditional information is useless 
for policy terms. That's right on one extreme. Uh, I'm suggesting that uh, that view is not particularly um, well-founded, but I recognize that there are people who think this way. If you can't quantify it very often, people feel it is of more limited value. My argument is that qualitative information is just as important as quantitative, and the best approach is to link the so-called hard quantitative information with the qualitative information to create new understandings. So if we can persuade um, people to look at our atlases more effectively, for example, the one which we produced called the Pan Inuit Trails Atlas raised a huge degree of interest in uh, the Canadian community. We must have done hundreds of interviews across the way. Why? because it was linked to the concept of Arctic territory, or territoriality. And uh, Mr. Harper is uh, famed for saying, if you don't use it, we'll lose it. His position, of course, is not tenable in intellectual terms or in legal terms either, but that doesn't matter. He's a politician. Uh, so I think that the only way you can do it is to, in fact, persuade policymakers that what you have to say is of value to them. Anytime I'm speaking to a, a cabinet member or anybody else for that matter, I usually take their own writing, uh, produce uh, uh, an a map of that writing on the issue concerned, and just by the by, show them why this policy is important. And immediately they relate to their own territory and to their own votes and uh, pay some attention. Um, it's not easy, but it can be done. Um, but it uh, does necessitate a bit of a paradigm shift to, oh yes. to yes. include that, that information. It requires a problem. paradigm shift. Um, in fact, I read a recent paper by some researchers here at McGill who'd uh, analyzed um, Arctic, uh, the magazine Arctic and said that this idea of including traditional knowledge has been around now for at least 10 years. Has it in fact affected science? And they came to the conclusion that 80% of the articles in the magazine over the last 10 to 15 years did not use traditional knowledge at all. They were still on the old scientific paradigm and had not shifted. So even the so-called hard scientists working in the North, who all of them believe the rhetoric on the importance of involving traditional knowledge, they're not doing it as effectively as they might. Why? It's much harder to change the way you've done things for many years. Uh, and another thing, of course, is maybe it's a threat to uh, your particular position of power or influence. You are no longer the expert. There are others out there arguing, and maybe they haven't even been to university. Um, I'm working with a, a graduate student at the moment who's uh, doing her atlas work on the work of William Commander. William Commander was an Aboriginal elder who was a grade four dropout. But the value of what he has to say about environment and issues is very important. Nobody listened, and if they listened, they patted him on the head and said, yes, nice, very nice, thank you very much, and went off and did what they wanted to do. So we need a paradigm shift. But the only way to get a paradigm shift, I think, is to challenge the existing paradigms and to do so in a way which um, causes people to think and to rethink their position and uh, you asked me um, what kinds of things would I like to see changing. I would like to see people challenge the way that they currently do things and to think about new ways of doing those things to increase our understanding. Sounds like a perfect way to end this talk. Thank you very much, Professor Taylor, for your time. For <coughs> The audience said it to you many times, a very fascinating talk. And it'll be interesting to watch where this technology goes from here. And once again, congratulations on winning the Killam Prize this year. Thank you very Thank much. You. So it's my pleasure to officially thank uh, Jackie and Professor Taylor uh, on behalf of McGill and the Neuro. Thank you, Jackie, for moderate, your excellent moderation of this conversation, and also Professor Taylor for your insights. I dare say 
provocative insights uh, and uh, very uh, interesting conversation. So I'll invite you another round of applause for Jackie. Yeah. And, uh, I, I want to thank the Killam Trust and uh, the Canada Council for their vision and leadership in bringing these talks to Canadian universities. And I think tonight was an excellent example of uh, a uh, wonderful uh, discussion ten, uh, disc and, uh, and uh, provocative um, challenges that were brought up by Professor Taylor. And really uh, congratulating you on the prize, but also on making uh, cyber cartography and your area of research very accessible. Uh, to the audience and really uh, helping us to understand it uh, so beautifully. I, I, I myself was struck by the word enabling came to me. I don't think you really used it. Um, and really the, the, enable, the enabling of the social science that you're doing with this technology and also the enabling of the, the power of the communities. And uh, really an excellent example, I think, of how technology can be used to enable uh, the research and also the power of the communities as you, as you, as you described. And I was also struck by, and, and uh, perhaps I'm wrong here, you didn't actually say this, by the interdisciplinarity. I have a feeling there's a lot of interdisciplinarity behind this uh, that would be wonderful to explore on another occasion, but I heard a lot of, uh, I suspect you're an excellent listener <laughs> and, uh, and that you listen to um, not only to the communities but to the other disciplines that you work with. And you we, are, we are very transdisciplinary. In our offices we have as many as 12 different disciplines as varied as music, English language, yeah, literature, yep. and a range of other, other things. But as far as listening is concerned, um, I think you better talk to my wife. She thinks I never <laughs> listen. <laughs> okay, we'll take that. We'll take consideration. But I think the, the transdisciplinarity really shines through, and I suspect that that's uh, um, the, uh, a lot of the strength of the work that you're describing, that it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's, there's a richness to the maps that you're creating that is informed by, uh, by your discipline, by cartography, but also by the disciplines and the people you work with. It's, I, I could hear that the information there is much richer than one or two disciplines, and so I'm not surprised when you say that 12 disciplines are, are behind this. So I, I really just want to thank you again. Thank the audience for, your, uh, for coming out this evening and, uh, and also for your uh, participation and, um, and excellent questions. It really, I'm, I'm very impressed with the turnout. Uh, I want to invite you for a very... Um, uh, a very uh, nice, uh, warm reception. I invite you to taste some refreshments. I guess until we have an atlas that we can taste, I'm looking forward to that. I invite you to taste this, the ordinary in, you know, ordinary in vivo uh, refreshments that are in the, waiting for you in the hall. So thank you very much yeah. and have a nice May day. May I, before we close, say thank you very much to my colleagues at McGill for being such excellent hosts this evening. And thank you, Jackie. And uh, So I have a also, small uh, token of a McGill oh. appreciation for you, Professor Taylor. <coughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. It was good. Thank you.